Good morning and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for participating um, in this session. Um, the session is about um, SAP HANA on SUSE KVM um, and our efforts around that topic. Um, I will um, give a short overview on um, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and uh, also the, the, the scenarios that we can cover with um, the, the, the validations around SAP, um, around the hypervisor validation. Um, and Dario uh, afterwards will um, talk about the deeper um, configuration um, technicalities um, of a um, virtual machine and um, how we transport as much performance um, through the abstraction layer. Um, the most important stuff first. Um, I am Arne Wolf, this is Dario Fagioli. Um, I am a SAP solution architect in the uh, sub-emerging technologies solutions team and Dario is a virtualization specialist with um, focus on virtualization performance in the, the Linux system labs core team. <coughs> um, my part, the hypervisor validation um, scope and roadmap. Um, what's the big deal? Um, the goal is obviously and for as always customer satisfaction. Um, they need a calculable way to measure performance and um, also uh, want to predict the risks that are involved with um, uh, virtualizing SAP HANA. Um, therefore, SAP has um, created um, a comprehensive certification validation structure for some of the products, especially SAP HANA, uh, which um, software and hardware partners need to um, validate their products through. Um, in our case, that's the KVM hypervisor that needs to be validated. And um, the goal is to show that the performance deviation between a system running SAP HANA, um, bare metal, and a VM um, does not cross um, a given tolerance li li limit. Um, the challenges um, involved are to create a very specific and well-defined environment to run SAP HANA inside the VM. And um, as I already said, transporting almost bare metal performance through the abstract abstraction layer. We'll talk about that second challenge a little more later um, if I have time left. Um, the validation scope. Um, if we do a validation, um, it's bound to what is listed on the left side. Um, the hypervisor version, in our case, also then the slash SP version, um, and uh, the CPU architecture, the number of CPU sockets, the amount of memory, um, the storage type, and the validation scenario. What I mean is, if we validate slash 15 SP4 and the um, associated hypervisor for single VM on a Cascade Lake CPU with three terabyte of RAM, then it's that. A customer can use it and get support for that and not for anything else. Um, so it's quite a lot of effort to keep up with the um, progress. Um, yeah. um, the roadmap looks like that. Um, we have done single VM for um, the Skylake-based um, CPU architecture for single VM in 2022, and um, for single VM and multi VM in 2023. And are currently trying to validate um, single VM, multi VM in scale up mode, and um, with live migration as a stretch goal um, in this, for the Sapphire Rapids um, CPU architecture. Um, From a memory size and number of socket limit perspective, this means um, that we have done th uh, four, CPU core, uh, four CPU sockets and three terabyte of RAM in 2022, six terabyte and four CPU sockets in 2023 for Cascade Lake, and um, now aiming at, I'm not re at reading this, um, at three validations since 
as of now, we, have, we cannot just validate the biggest and have everything else included, but as of now, this, these are three separate validations, um, which we are aiming at for the Sapphire Rapids uh, CPU architecture and the current um, time frame. Um, in writing, this means we are validating slash 15 SP5 on the Sapphire Rapids um, CPU architectures for servers with up to two, four, and eight sockets, four, eight, and 16 terabyte of RAM um, inside the VM. We are aiming at all three storage types. That means NFS um, storage, fiber channel, and direct attached. Um, and we are trying to do that for single and multi VM scenarios. Again, stretched goal would be the live migration. That's a personal thing for me. I would like to have that, but we'll see. Um, current pain points. Um, so I have time to go to that. That's good. Um, already in the last validation cycles, um, we experienced um, problems with latency in general, leading to for example, um, that we had to deactivate everything that would count as boosters, like the turbo mode, and um, a step stuff like that, because we got in, um, the, 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 the latency was unpredictable, and since we are measuring the performance deviation between a bare metal system and a virtual machine, unpredictable, un unpredictable latency, um, was a big problem, um, as it w killed all our uh, uh, results. Second pain point, and let me go to the next slide here to uh, prioritize a little. Storage is um, a problem, um, and I'm addressing that here uh, because I hope that someone in the audience uh, feels um, that he or she has something to uh, tell me, thank you, Hannes. Um, let, let's talk later. Um, um, the major pain here is, and um, moving to the next slide again, uh, the overall and average latency involved with um, write performance. Um, what you see here is um, self-explaining, actually. I picked the worst uh, results um, for that one. Let's talk about the upper one. We are writing a payload of 16 gigabytes um, with a block size for, uh, at 64 megabytes. And um, with uh, the Virt IO based pass through device, uh, we have a latency of roughly 60,000 microseconds in average. Um, the VFIO pass through device is around 40,000. And the same test on bare metal, on the same system, same devices, everything identical, is at roughly 20,000 for that. Um, I don't have to explain that this is a problem that we ha have to deal with and um, gives us a great pain when re remembering that we try to stay inside a very small gap um, um, regarding performance between virtual machine and bare metal. Um, not every test, it's not just benchmarks um, that, that involve storage, but storage is a part of um, the overall performance, obviously. So again, everybody who is involved with write performance, um, preferably in the KVM world, I'm very happy to talk in the next two days. Um, last but not least, um, for the already done validation um, and um, supported scenarios, there is a SUSE best practices guide um, uh, available um, on um, our document library. Uh, the links are in the presentation that probably will be shared. Um, if you want to know details, there's everything in there that we are talking about here, um, including a full configuration of one of our uh, high-performance virtual machines. <coughs> um, I think that's it for me, um, and I give it to you, Dario. Um. Yeah.
and the mic is on, so I guess I can start my part as well. Thank you, Arne, for both the introduction and uh, this first part of the presentation. What I will try to give you um, some more details uh, about is uh, what we actually do, how we actually configure and tune the, uh, I, I could say both the hypervisor and the guest, but it's mostly hypervisor tuning work, to be honest, or at least the, the things that we do in the guest are pretty much the same that we would do um, on any uh, system, either bare metal or, uh, in this case, virtual machine that runs um, uh, ANA. So, it's uh, already it's something that we have in other documents already, and uh, it's uh, the least interesting part for this presentation. So let's focus on the host uh, and the hypervisor and the VM, <coughs> sorry, and the VM configuration itself. Um, <coughs> so yes, these are some details about hardware and versions of the operating system, but Arne covered that. Uh, uh, well, uh, already. So, what do we do? What what it is that you find in that guide that was shown in the previous slide? If you try to read it, you will uh, you will see that. <coughs> yeah, sorry again. You will see that we um, that we do all the uh, usual and common things that uh, you do when you want to achieve best performance of a uh, inside a virtual machine. So we do. Uh, virtual CPU pinning, uh, we do that in a way that uh, uh, both uh, CPU and NUMA topology uh, matches uh, uh, from inside of the VM, it matches the one on the host. We do things like um, using uh, uh, huge pages, uh, uh, so these are the most um, very important but also the most common um, mechanisms and techniques for tuning VMs. We have it easy, you may think, and it's actually true, uh, at least from the point, at least because <coughs> we can uh, actually partition the, uh, the host in case we have multiple VMs, or in general, do uh, this kind of uh, static assignment of uh, physical resources like uh, virtual CPUs and memory, but also other uh, other resources, to the VM or the VMs, because uh, we don't have uh, yet, at least as far as I know, uh, not even planned, uh, oversubscribed scenario. So we can, do, we can do this, which is very good when you, if you can do that when you want to tune virtualization. Uh, for I.O., we use uh, also uh, typical techniques like SRIOV, uh, and then for storage, Arne mentioned that uh, we have some problems, but at the same time, at least we have been able for the previous rounds of validation to achieve uh, good enough performance by um, passing through the storage controller to the VM or the VMs, as far as we have uh, enough of them. Uh, it took a while to figure out that uh, for tuning uh, uh, a VM that should run an in-memory database, uh, the bottleneck was storage. It took a while to figure that out and then to believe and convince ourselves that it was the case, but apparently it is. Uh, no, I should click here. Okay, so uh, of, those, of all those things that, I, uh, that, uh, that you saw in that uh, previous slide, I will uh, only quickly mention the ones that I said are the most common. Uh, on one end because, as I said, they are the most common, and on the other end because Dawi has a talk about uh, uh, some of them um, on tomorrow, I think. So, yeah, go, go to his talk and see it. But yeah, as I said, we do uh, virtual CPU to physical CPU pinning, and we do it in a way that uh, we can then uh, match the virtual topology uh, of the virtual CPUs of the virtual machine to the physical topology, so we do it properly, like uh, this, well, no, the point, well, like this and not like this. We use um, huge pages for memory uh, because of because then we get a, a shorter page walk, less TLB misses, and all the things that are, I guess, pretty uh, common. Otherwise, you can ask me offline. I'm not going into details about these aspects. Uh, we really want to, to to be able to use huge pages. We, it's really sensitive. The workload is really sensitive to <coughs> to that, as you can imagine. In fact. Um, 
we also uh, switch off the ITLB multi-heat mitigation because otherwise we lose huge pages and if we do that, we don't reach, we are, we are not that uh, happy with performance any longer. And <clears throat> that's it for this part. What I want to spend a um, little bit more time about, <clears throat> yeah, sorry for my voice, uh, are these two or three things which are um, maybe less common tricks about uh, uh, yeah, virtualization tuning. Uh, because yeah, I, I thought it was interesting, it would be interesting to um, yeah, give you some information about them. Uh, point is, as I said, we can do uh, resource partitioning uh, and uh, what happens is that, um, what happens when we do that uh, is uh, that all the problems, uh, all the, uh, yeah, all, all, everything that uh, in all the years that virtualization has been around and has been uh, developed, uh, uh, that were aimed at solving mainly throughput and uh, um, host utilization problem, especially if you have oversubscription of the host. Uh, thank you. <laughs> It's even sparkling, which I like better. Thank you. <laughs> then I don't want to flood the laptop. So yeah, uh, there's a bunch of things that happens. They're even there by default because the most common scenario for virtualization is probably considered the one when you have a lot of VMs running on a shared host and you want to be sure that you can uh, that you get the maximum throughput that you are able to utilize the host as much, the host resources as much as you can. In our case, it's the opposite. And these things are actually even in the way uh, some of the time. Uh, but on the other end, we don't need them, uh, luckily enough for us, because we don't have uh, to care about um, oversubscription. We care both about throughput and latency. Uh, but while throughput is fine, aside for uh, storage, as we said, uh, in some configuration. Uh, latency is the thing with which we had the most problems. And so by, funnily enough, by disabling some of these things, we can get back some uh, latency. So we basically take all the, th the things that in the year have been done to make virtualization cool and fancy and get, uh, get, get rid of them. That's the point. And this is, this is not the first example. Too. This is the first example. Sorry, I didn't realize that I skipped this slide. So, one uh, first thing that I show you uh, as an example of that uh, is, this thing, is this thing called um, uh, PLE gap or post loop exiting or um, as many names. What happens is that uh, um, if you think about uh, a typical uh, uh, spin lock usage situation on bare metal, which you see an example of up there, uh, uh, some uh, uh, physical CPUs acquires a spin lock and some other CPU, so, so, something else running on another CPU wants to uh, enter the same critical session, tries to acquire the same spin lock and start, well, guess what, spinning, which is fine. In a virtualization scenario, so uh, if the same thing happens, uh, but if uh, at some point while there is already someone spinning on that uh, lock, the virtual CPU that uh, uh, is holding it, uh, is preempted by the hypervisor, taken away of the physical CPU, then we have this other guy spinning on, uh, on, on something that isn't even running, uh, which is fine functionally, but uh, it's not very good. You are wasting uh, uh, physical CPU resources because this vCPU is, in this example, at least running on a physical CPU. And we don't want that if you want to maximize the utilization. In our case, um, since we are pinning and statically assigning host resources to virtual to, to, to VM or VMs, we can reasonably assume, and the numbers uh, uh, confirm that, that even, this guy is pre even if this guy is preempted, he's going to be able to get back uh, to its assigned physical CPU fairly soon. So actually having it, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, so to, my bad, to, cure, to, to mitigate this problem um, in, uh, more common virtualization scenario, what happens is that uh, uh, thanks to this post-loop exiting feature, uh, the 
uh, spinning guy is um, itself uh, uh, removed from the, from the physical CPU and the schedule. But in our case, we don't want to do that because this operation actually uh, increased the latency because it's uh, uh, VM exit, the scheduling, whatever, everything that is involved. And on the other end, as, as I was saying uh, before, the um, the virtual CPU that is holding the, the spin lock is probably going to be back uh, scheduled and running on, the, on its physical CPU soon enough. So, again, a uh, perfect example. One feature designed to make virtualization nicer and uh, uh, increase the throughput uh, the, the, from a general, from a overall uh, host point of view and uh, even more the if utilization efficiency of the host itself it's actually hurting gas and we want to get rid of it, of it which, likely, uh, which luckily we can, we can do. And this is uh, another example of a very similar thing. It's, uh, it also, uh, it's also related to uh, spinning uh, again. And uh, it, what the, it happens in this case uh, when, you, the, when we have to deal with uh, uh, TLB flashes and, and, and invalidation, and uh, again, the, uh, the way it works uh, on uh, bare metal uh, is that uh, one um, CPU uh, initiates a TLB flash operation, and the same uh, has to be then, uh, same operation has to be then performed on all the other CPUs in the system, so uh, a message is sent to all the other uh, CPUs, and then uh, uh, the initiator wait spinning uh, uh, until uh, everyone else is done. And again, if it happens, I uh, don't have the picture, detailed picture for it, but it's very similar to the previous one. If it happens in a, in a virtual machine, uh, you may have uh, uh, this guy, the initiator, spinning, uh, waiting for an hack of other virtual CPU having uh, done the operation of uh, flashing the TDB of the CPU where they're running on, but uh, they might not even be running because uh, everything is virtual, they, there could be something else, some other vCPU from some other VMs, some other host task running on those CPU. And so we are spinning and waiting for something that uh, is delayed, well, maybe not undefinitely, but uh, uh, potentially for quite some time. But not for us, not for us, because in our case, all the other virtual CPUs are either already running on their statically assigned uh, physical CPU, or they will be shortly enough. So we don't bother and we disable this as well. Last one, it's about uh, power management if you want, although there shouldn't be any power management in VMs. So let's see. Um, what happens when, uh, and this is, uh, this is the one uh, of the ones that uh, add the most impact on uh, being able to achieve the performance that we need for, uh, for the validation. And it's actually the reason why we, we also do the previous two, not only because they are good uh, themselves, but because we need to uh, set this thing, which is in dedicated state on in the VM configuration, uh, which is a yeah, configuration flag that you, can, uh, that, you can, that you can set to your, to your VM, for your VM. Which, yes, does the two things, disable PLE gap, disable paravirtual spin implementation, disable uh, PV, TLB flashing. But more important, for, even more important for us, it allows you to use the CPU idle at pole governor inside of the VM. What's the, that thing that I just, what's this thing that I just called CPU idle at pole governor? Well, what happens when a CPU, or in our case, a virtual CPU becomes idle? So the idle task is scheduled. Uh, by the scheduler of the guest OS, uh, and uh, the HLT instruction is executed, you get a VM exit, and the vCPU task is the scheduled. Or, in a little bit more details, not a CPU uh, power management uh, uh, expert, uh, but uh, uh, I guess I can at least say that uh, what actually happens is that the idle, ta the idle task is scheduled, the CPU idle framework in the kernel uh, kicks in, the CPU idle governor decides what to do uh, at some point, uh, most of the time, HLT uh, instruction is executed in the guest, which causes a VM exit, and the vCPU is the scheduled. Uh, as you may have, as you may be starting to figure out, this thing that vCPU are the scheduled uh, and we get VM exit, it's something that we really want to avoid, even if it costs us 
uh, wasting host performance because we are not really wasting them in our case. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, having to uh, go through AVM exit, a context switch, and then as soon as the vCPU becomes active again, which may be even very shortly after, uh, after it becoming idle, we have to uh, suffer from another context switch and AVM enter to get it uh, the, 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 the stuff that it was executing back to running. Can we get rid of that too? Well, we can, and we can do it in two ways. One, and, and both uh, involved uh, what's called typically polling, uh, which is another word for spinning if you want. Uh, and we can do this polling at the host level or inside of the guest. Doing it at the host level is something that uh, it's there in Linux from quite some time. And what it means is, what it means is that um, when uh, uh, basically here, instead of uh, this schedule, we are already in the host, we already, we already exited the VM, instead of uh, the scheduling the vCPU task right away, we wait a little bit. If it becomes active uh, soon enough, uh, we just enter the, v the VM again without uh, uh, paying the price of two context switches. And this is there and fine, but it's not enough for us. Uh, you do that, you configure things like this, you don't get the performance we need. What has been introduced in the kernel, well, now it's a while that as well, but uh, more recently, it's doing a similar thing, but inside of the VM. So if you enable this special CPU idle governor, what happens is that when a vCPU becomes idle, uh, you start uh, polling and spinning for a little while inside of it without even exiting. Uh, which, of course, as it's easy to imagine, uh, it's uh, fast, I mean, it's a lot less latency from the VM point of view. You don't even exit to the host. What's the downside? The downside is that uh, we are uh, occupying the, um, the physical CPU, even if uh, we, in theory, have nothing to do on it, uh, and even if there could be <coughs> either host tasks or other VM vCPUs uh, that wanted to run it would be able to do useful things with the CPU. But Again, we don't care, because in our case, there's no such thing. Uh, we don't do much on the host, and there aren't any VM. Even in the multi-VM scenario, there are multiple VMs, but we do partitioning. And so we get rid of this, of this thing as well, or we enable CPU adult pod, if you want, which has been developed uh, in Reddit, if you, uh, for what matters, uh, but uh, for what we know, more or less for, I mean, for probably for uh, very similar situations, if not same. And uh, yeah, that's it. So yeah, as I said, I tried to give you an overview of these features because I think they were the, the less known and interesting and, and the, more, the most interesting because they're a little bit special. And uh, I think we are done. And yes, 